Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Today I'm going to answer this question. Is this the end? Is this the end? So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. And he says it's not for you to know. What he's saying is you will not know. So don't even try. How many know, parents, there's some things your kids just don't know? Amen? Amen? Okay. We might need to do a parenting uh, sermon next week. Okay. But you will receive power. Notice this. But you will receive power. You're, you're trying to figure out the end times. You will receive power. You're trying to figure out when the world's going to end. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus has been resurrected for 40 days. Luke says he's been teaching them about the kingdom of God for 40 days. And at the end of these 40 days, the disciples say, so is this like, is this the end? We, we getting out of here? You going to overthrow Rome? Are we, are we done? Jesus says, you guys are focused on all the wrong things. The Holy Spirit's going to fill you. And you're not going to be worried about, is this the end? You're not going to be worried about yourself. You're going to be a witness. You're going to be thinking about changing the world. So I want to answer the question today, is this the end? Let's pray. Father, speak to us now in Jesus' name. And everybody said a big amen. Amen Amen and amen. Thank you, brother. Is this the end? I want to answer three questions for you today. Um, I can answer the first two clearly. The third question you're going to have to answer for yourself. Number one, are we in the end times? Answer, yes. We're in the end times. This is it, y'all. We in it. We are in the last days. We are in the end times. We are in the end of the age. This, we are in the last days. I can answer that clearly, not because of the rise of technology or knowledge. Not because we seem to be getting closer to a one world government. Not because of a microchip that people in Switzerland are taking or that my dog took. (laughs) Not all dogs go to heaven. Some take the mark of the beast and (laughs) my God, we need to pray for Bentley. Maybe there's grace. I don't know. Not because of COVID-19, not because of the peace deal between Israel and the UAE. Not even because the embassy was moved to Jerusalem. Not even because Israel became a nation in 1948. I believe all of those events could be significant. And for certain Bible scholars, they absolutely believe they're significant. But that's not why we're in the end times. Scholars have been debating the relevance of events like that for many years, and they're not going to stop. It should also be noted that I... Do not get my theology from headlines. Yeah? I don't get my theology from the newspaper. I don't get my theology from CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or any other one. I don't get my theology from there. We go to the Bible, not the headlines. We do not read the Bible through the lens of current events. We don't read a scripture and go, can I make what's happening right now fit into this? Because you can. But you might be wrong like a lot of other people. Even the phones are saying amen. We read current events through the lens of the Bible. One more time, we do not read the Bible through the lens of current events. We read current events through the lens of Scripture. Are we in the last days? Yes, but not because of anything that is happening on the planet. We are in the last days because the Bible says we're in the last days. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. The Holy Spirit's just been poured out. The believers have been filled with the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus said they would be. They start preaching the gospel. They start speaking in other languages. It's called speaking in tongues. They begin to prophesy. They begin to preach. And people say, what is happening? And Peter says, Guys, this is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. In the last days, look at this, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It's also Joel chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. In the last days, 
God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The end times started the day the church started. The end times began the same day the church of the Lord Jesus began. On Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit is poured out. And on that day, every disciple knew, every apostle knew, this is the last days, the Spirit of God is being poured out just like the Old Testament prophets prophesied. Let me continue. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken by his Son. By the way, this does not mean that prophecy no longer is real today or, or relevant today. It just means that every prophet has to go through this filter. Hey, so when a prophet tells you they're speaking for God and it doesn't line up with his son, it's not prophecy. So when a homie tells me, you know, the Lord told me I can leave my wife, I go, where's that one? <laughs> prophet. I haven't found that one yet. Shannon hasn't found that one yet. Amen. We haven't. Praise the Lord. COVID got a little dark there in July. Come on, somebody. No, I'm just kidding. You know what I'm saying, right? Like, if you say you're prophesying, but it doesn't, I'm totally kidding. My gosh. If, if you say you're prophesying and it doesn't line up with scripture, you're not prophesying. Might be witchcraft, but it's not the Bible. Because God speaks through his son now. So every prophecy is in obedience to what the scripture's already taught. Okay. Whom he appointed, heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. If you walked up to the author of Hebrews, whoever that was, and said, are we in the last days? 2,000 years ago, he would have said, absolutely. These are the last days. We're in the last days. When did it start? It started on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. So why the delay? If we're in the last days and have been in the last days, what's up? Like, when's this happening? But by the way, it, when you read First and Second Thessalonians, the whole point of the book is the apostle Paul telling them, you didn't miss the second coming of Christ. Because there was a whole church in fear going, we missed it. We're in trouble. Look at all this persecution. Look at all the crazy things that are happening. We obviously missed the second coming of Jesus. So Paul writes a letter going, no, you, you didn't miss it. It'll, it'll be unmistakable. Everyone will know it. It'll change the world. Don't worry. You didn't miss the second coming. That's the whole point. So this was in the theology of the New Testament church that Jesus could come back at any moment. Come on. And the same is true today. So why has he not returned yet? Second Peter chapter three, verse eight. Don't forget this one thing. Don't forget this one thing. Don't forget this one thing. <laughs> I didn't say that Peter said that. Don't forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, why hasn't the Lord come? Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's, what we think of as delay is actually God's patience. God's giving people opportunity. God's people, giving, God's giving people the opportunity to receive Christ. God, God is saying, yo, this is not delay. This is, he, he would go on to talk about how there would be scoffers who would say, man, where is this return? I mean, come on, I thought, I thought it was gonna happen already. And he would say, look, this is just God's patience. God is so good. God is so kind. He's giving you more opportunity. He's giving you more time. He's, this is God's goodness. This is God's patience. So are we in the end times? Yes, but let me just also clarify. You're in your end times. <laughs> James chapter four, verse 14 says, this is life, it's a mist. This is life, it's a vapor. This is life, here today, gone tomorrow. It is fast. 
Jamin, I'm gonna live to be 500 years old. I just believe that's gonna, by it's gonna be a miracle or technology. That's awesome. 500 compared to eternity? 50 compared to eternity? Fast. 125 compared to eternity? Fast. 85 compared to, it doesn't matter how long you live, it is very short compared to eternity. Life is a mist. And so, last days or not, we're in our last days. I want to live a long life. I believe I'm going to see my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I believe I'm going to live a long life and I'm going to see God do great things. But listen, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how long I live. It is short compared to what I'm doing for eternity. So we're in our last day. You're in your last days. We're in the last days, yes. Number two, is Jesus coming back? Yes. Everyone say yes to that. Yes. Okay, we, we should all believe that. Okay, that's one of the big ones. That's right up there with like virgin birth, resurrection, <laughs> second coming of Christ. Okay, that's one of, the, it's one of the biggies. Okay. Is Jesus coming back? Yes. So Jesus says, you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. You're going to be a witness. That's verse eight, verse nine. Acts chapter one, verse nine. Right after he spoke those words, the disciples saw Jesus lifted into the sky and disappear into the clouds. They stared into the sky watching Jesus ascend. Two men in white robes suddenly appeared beside them and they told the startled disciples, why are you staring up into the sky? It would almost be like them going, yo, you, you were at the last supper. Jesus said, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. I'm leaving, the Holy Spirit's coming. Stop staring at the sky. Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but he will come back the same way that you saw him ascend. Jesus physically ascended, and on the day of his return, he will physically descend. He will not spiritually return. He will physically return, and the Bible says every eye will see him. He physically left the earth in his body and he will physically return in his body. Okay. He came the first time as a lamb. He will return the second time as a lion. He came the first time as a servant. He will return the second time as a king. He rode a donkey the first time into Jerusalem, but on the second return to Jerusalem, he will return on a white horse. The first time he came, he came to die. But the second time he will return to defeat his last enemy, our last enemy, the last enemy, and that enemy is called death. And Jesus will come back and death will die. Death will be defeated. Satan will be thrown into the abyss and there will be victory forever. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I'm telling you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Paul said there will be a generation that will be alive at the second coming. Is it us? I don't think so, but cool if it is. But I'm not, I'm ready for it, but I'm not living for it because I'm preparing to build campuses and churches and raise my family. Does that make sense? See, y'all can't even clap because y'all so scared that it's going to happen. That's why we don't prepare for the future. Because every generation thinks they're the last generation. And that's why there isn't generational wealth. That's why there isn't generational legacy. Because they just think they're going up. And then they leave nothing for their kids. I'm talking to you on the camera. And then we leave nothing for our kids. So I live in such a way that I'm ready for the return. But I also prepare in such a way that Jesus won't come back in my lifetime. That's wisdom. He said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment, of, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. There will be a physical resurrection on the day that the Lord Jesus returns. A physical resurrection. This is so much better than the thriller video. This is going to be fire. <laughs> See, because if, 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 if you die today, if I die today, are, we are what Hebrew says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Immediately in the presence of God, our spirit back in relationship with the spirit of God in heaven. But our body goes six feet under. But there will be a day that our physical bodies will physically resurrect 
pretty cool. And that corruption will take on incorruption and the mortal must put on immortality. This is 1 Corinthians 15, now verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Come on, on the day that Jesus returns, death dies, the grave is swallowed up in victory. We are resurrected from the dead and we will physically go into a physical city called heaven. We will physically with our eyes see a man named Jesus. The Bible says that heaven is 1,500 miles long, high, wide. It is a city that the Bible says will sit down on Jerusalem. Wow. It's not like we're, we are not going to be floating around with a harp <laughs> and a cloud floating through each other. We're not going to look like Casper, the friendly ghost. We're going to be real people on a real planet called Earth. We will live in a real city called heaven. Wow. So look what it says now, Revelation 21. This is the fulfillment of all things. Revelation 21, verse three. I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood. This has never been about God getting us out of here. This has always been about a garden. This has always been about God communing with man, walking with them in the cool of the day. This has never been about us going to God. This has always been radically different than religion. This has always been God coming to man. This has always been God with us. This has always been Emmanuel. Come on, anybody grateful for this? This has always been not us trying to claw to God, but God moving into our neighborhood. Because we're not good enough, holy enough, great enough to get to his neighborhood. So he just moved the whole neighborhood to our neighborhood. This is good news. They are his people. He is their God. And he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. Everything that breaks our heart today, gone. Disease and pandemics, gone. Recessions, gone. Cancer, gone. Death, gone. Gone. The enthroned continued, look, I'm making everything new. Write it all down, each word dependable and accurate. Then he said, it's happened. I'm A to Z. I'm the beginning and I am the conclusion. I'm the water of life well and I give freely to the thirsty. Conquerors will inherit this. I'll be God to them and they'll be my sons and my daughters. Can you say amen to God's word? Is Jesus coming back? Yes, and it will be a glorious day. It will be an awesome day. It will be a great day. Are we in the end times? Yes. Is Jesus coming back? Yes. Number three, are you ready? I can't answer that one. I could answer the first two questions very clearly. A lot of of questions I didn't answer, huh, that you want to know about. Who's the Antichrist? Is there a rapture? Is there a seven-year tribulation? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Can't answer those. I can only answer the two that I answered. But here's number three, and you have to answer it. Are you ready? Jesus said it like this, Luke chapter 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man returns, when, when, when I come back, will he find faith on the earth? Jabin, how do I know I'm ready for the second coming of Jesus? How do I know that I'm ready? How do I know that I can live in these end times and serve God? Faith. We called October fall revival. Because I know for the last few months, I mean, it's been very challenging for all of us on different levels, but a lot of people, they've really, they've really lost their faith. They've fallen back into bad habits, into lifestyles, addictions, wrong ways of thinking, and a lot of people are coming back going, man, I, I got to get 
I just got to get back on track with the Lord. I need to, I need to, I need to serve God. And so we call it revival, revive, life again, faith again, hope again, trust again, obedience again, surrender again. Will Jesus find faith on the earth? I hope so. I hope he'll find it in me. I hope he'll find it in you. I hope he'll find it in this church. The apostle John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, Anyone who has this hope, this hope of a second coming, this hope that Christ will return, anyone who has this hope purifies themselves. Purity is not legalism. Purity is not fear. Purity is preparation. Yeah? When you're, when you're preparing to get married, you eat a little different. You're exercising. You're trying to get a little swag. You're trying to get a little, because it's like, oh my gosh, they're going to see me naked. Yeah. When, we got, when we got buried, we didn't see each other naked yet. That was it. That was the first time. We had to prepare. Purity. You know, back in the day, you didn't have sex until you got married. You know, that's how, that's how it was. And, and that's how it should be. I should... Yeah, let me bring that one back. I would love to bring that one back. You sleep with one person, the person who has a ring on their finger and you gave it to them and you've said I do and that's it. And so, amen, okay. Ah, oh, Javen, you're so old, ah, yeah. I'll save you a lot of heartbreak if you'll do it God's way. And so, but, but so we prepared. We prepared. We waited. I, I'm, one day I'm gonna see the Lord and I'm gonna stand before him. No one's gonna be around me. It's going to be me and Jesus. And so I, I think about that. I prepare for that. I, it affects how I love people. It affects how I live. It affects how I think. It affects how I treat people. It affects, it affects how I act because I know that I'm, I'm here for such a short amount of time. But one day I'll stand before God. And that doesn't scare me, but it does prepare me. Yeah? I'm, I'm looking forward to the day. No fear in my heart. I mean, I am fired up for that day. But it affects the decisions I make every day. Because I know one day, even if no one finds out, one day I'll have to talk to God about it. Because <laughs> you can hold secrets from every person on this planet except one. It's, pure, it's, it's purity, but it's not fear. It's preparation. Are you ready? The Apostle Paul writes to his young apprentice, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. And he goes, Timothy, mark this. There's going to be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited. And now here's kind of, here's kind of everything I just said in one line. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Lovers of pleasure. This is a wild word in the Greek language. This lovers of pleasure phrase. It means people will be happy at the expense of everything. Say that one more time. People will choose happiness at the expense of everything. Including your family, including your morals, including your integrity, including your spouse, including your kids, including your relationship with Jesus, including, doesn't matter what it is. At the expense of everything, I just want to be happy. Listen, happiness is an awesome tool that God has given us that is a beautiful blessing. Happiness is a terrible God <laughs> that promises if I could just be happy and whatever it takes to be happy and whoever I have to step on to be happy and whatever, whoever I have to hurt to be happy, whatever secrets I have to create to be happy, I just, I deserve happiness. No, happiness is a gift from God. It is beautiful. I'm a, I'm a happy person. I'm, I'm, we're gonna go tomorrow. We're gonna go on vacation. I'm just gonna make me happy. Hey, I like happy, but I don't live for happy. I live for Jesus. 
Yeah, because I'm gonna be a lover of pleasure, I'm gonna be a lover of God, but I can't be both. So I love God. I, I, I love God at the expense of everything. Whoa. Jesus is, is, is everything to me. Jesus brings me happiness. Jesus affords me happiness. Jesus blesses me with things that bring happiness. But I cannot fall into lover of pleasure. Now, by the way, Paul's writing this to Timothy, a pastor. Paul's saying this is going to be church people. You know, a lot of people come to church just to see if it'll make them happy. They don't love God yet. They haven't surrendered yet. They haven't, they, Jesus is not Lord. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. What's the power? The power is the power to change. Here's what makes the gospel so beautiful, that it is not a list of do's and don'ts. It is not a Sunday morning experience. It is not, I have to. It is the transformational work of the Holy Spirit in my life. I have placed my faith in Jesus and I am no longer the same person. I have been transformed. I have been resurrected. I have been changed by the grace of God. This is, this. I am not, not denying its power. I am walking in the power of the gospel. As the apostle Paul said, I've been crushed crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I look the same, but I'm not the same. The day I went into the waters of baptism, I died to that old life and I've been resurrected in a new life. Come on. Anybody have that testimony? That's faith. That's faith. Not wasting our lives on pleasure, but living our life for Jesus, living to see people come to Christ, living for eternity. So the disciples, let me have Zach come on up. So the disciples are talking to Jesus in Acts chapter one and they say, all right, so man, is this it? You gonna, you gonna overthrow Rome now? We gonna, we gonna take Caesar on? You gonna get justice against Pontius Pilate? Let's go. And Jesus goes, oh my gosh, guys, you got it all messed up. You, you don't even get it. He goes, this isn't, this isn't about us getting justice. This isn't about the establishment of a earthly kingdom. You will receive power. And that power is not just for you. That power is to be a witness. I have not come to establish a physical kingdom. I have come to empower you to be a witness of the life change that I've done in your heart. And I want you to tell everybody about it. Don't get caught up in what is the Father's authority. You ain't gonna know it. Jesus said not even the Son knows it. There's just some stuff you're not gonna know. And while Christians are obsessing over dates and times and who is this and what does this mean and how does this work and, and they are trying to create a theology around the end times, they forget the clearest theology of the end times. Get filled with the Holy Ghost and be a witness. Amen. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and tell people about Jesus. Get full of the Holy Spirit and stop being obsessed with yourself and help somebody else. That's, that's my end times theology. My end times theology is get busy. You will not find this on Facebook. You will not find this from the newest prophet who pops up on YouTube. You will not find this from the next social media prophet that tells you what they saw and what they... They don't talk about this because all of their prophecy leads you back to you and fear. And Jesus goes, can you just let me baptize you with the Holy Spirit? And can you just be a walking, talking witness of my goodness in your life? That's all I'm looking for. That's all I want. There's a lot I don't know. That's in the Father's authority. Here's what I do know. I need the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. Jesus said, here's what it's like. 
It's like a master calling his 10 servants together and he gives them all $10. And he said to them, engage in business until I come back. King James says, occupy till I come. In other words, I'm gonna give you talents. I'm gonna give you money. I'm gonna give you giftings. I'm gonna give you anointings. I'm gonna give you callings and destiny. Work it. Live for me using everything I've entrusted to you until I come back. It's not yours it's mine. I'm trusting with you. I'm trusting you with it. Work it. Establish the kingdom. Be a witness. Care about people. Don't just store up for yourself treasure on this earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Live for the kingdom. Live for eternity. Live for something bigger than yourself. That's when Jesus comes back, I promise you, I'm going to be so happy, and I'm also going to be so busy. <laughs> I think it's cool that we don't have to obsess over when and how, and is it this or is it that, or you could, find, you could buy 10 different books by 10 different brilliant theologians today on Amazon that are that are all smarter, I mean, just brilliant, and they all have their own theology on the end times. Or we could just keep our last day's theology right there with Acts chapter two. Amen. I need the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna tell everybody I know about Jesus. I'm not here for me. I'm here for the world. I'm not here to build my kingdom. I'm here to build God's kingdom. I'm not here just for mine and my stuff. I'm here to do something great for God. I have a purpose. I have a destiny. I have a gifting. And I'm going to work that thing. And I'm going to occupy that thing. And I'm going to do that thing until Jesus returns. Somebody say amen to this preacher. Come on. Clap your hands. Give God some praise. Purpose. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 14. You are to be light. Bringing out the God colors of the world. There's a lot of beautiful color in this room. A lot of different shades of skin, a lot of different hair colors, a lot of different clothing colors, a lot of different purse colors and shoe colors. A lot of different lipstick shades. A lot, of, a lot of beauty, a lot of color in this room. If we turn off all these lights, we don't see any of it. Jesus says, turn the light on. Turn the light on. Bring out the God colors of the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. As public as the light on the stratosphere. As public as the light on the pyramid. Come on, somebody that you see driving in from Prim. And if I make you light bears, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket. How many are living like that, huh? How many are living like that? They're on Facebook and they're hiding and they're going, Jesus is coming back. I figured out who the Antichrist is. <laughs> I figured out who's doing everything and I figured out it's, which I love conspiracy theories because that makes you think there's only like five bad people in the world. There are so many bad people in the world. Let me just tell you that. Like you're bad. But anyway, like we're all bad. Like there are five bad people. There's a lot of bad people. And I, and we're, and there's a, and there's a whole world. They're saying, can you get out of there? Can you just look at somebody and go, Jesus loves you. I, I love you. God has a plan for your life. We're not perfect, but we're forgiven. We're not perfect, but we've been filled with power from on high. God can change your life. 
I'm putting you on the light stand now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand. Shine. Everybody say shine. One more time. Say shine. Keep an open house. Be generous with your lives. Lead a small group, Jesus just said. Praise God. I might have added that to the scripture. Amen. Have an open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God. Are we in the end? Yeah. Is Jesus coming back? Yes. Soon, I hope. Are you ready? If you're not, this is your moment. Watch it online. Maybe you're not ready. This is your moment. You're here in the room. You say, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to rededicate my life to Christ. This is your moment. I want to pray with you. Will he find faith in you? Today's your day. I hope this message wasn't scary or spooky or I hope it just builds your faith. I hope it just builds your faith. If you need to surrender your life to Christ, you're in, you're in the last days. You're in your last days. I want you to be ready. So what do I do, preacher? This man asked Paul that. It's Acts chapter 16. It's in the Bible. This man walks up to a preacher named Paul. And he said, sir, what do I, what do I got to do to be saved? How do I do this? Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe and you will be saved. Let's believe together. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Not really to give you. I'm, I'm giving you the words to say, but I can't give you the heart to pray it. That's got to come from you. I can't give you the belief, but I can give you the words. And if you'll attach your faith to these words, God will change your life. Let's pray together. Everyone say, Jesus, I give you my life. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. So I turn from my old life. I turn towards you. I fully surrender my life to Jesus. And I declare... With all of my heart, Jesus is Lord of my life. Let's celebrate all those people. I believe even more online are giving their life to Christ. Oh, let's really celebrate.